Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I am Thomas Schmeng, the Director of Programs for the Tower Center Student Forum. Uh, so we've got a great presentation tonight. Um, for those of you that are new to the Tower Center Student Forum or looking to get more involved, uh, the Student Forum is, uh, started as branched out from the Tower Center in the spring of 2010. Uh, and it serves as a way to uh, allow students to collaborate with scholars and experts on a variety of research topics. Um, we bring in speakers like Professor Wilson tonight, um, and then in the spring we have an undergraduate research journal. So um, if you're interested in that, uh, we'd love to get you more involved. Come speak to Brandon or myself after the event tonight, and we'd be happy to, to facilitate that. If you're also interested in learning more about the Tower Center events, um, we encourage you to like us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, that's, that's probably the best way for, I know students um, tend to go on social media a lot, so that might be a good way to keep up with the events at the Tower Center. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Andrew Wilson tonight. He's the Philip A. Crow Professor of Comparative Strategy at the United States Naval War College. Uh, he received a BA in East Asian Studies from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and earned his PhD in History and East Asian Languages from Harvard. Before joining uh, the Naval War College's Department of Strategy and Policy, he taught Chinese history at Harvard and Wellesley College, uh, and he uh, is an expert on Chinese history, Asian military affairs, the classics of strategic theory, Chinese military mo modernization, and Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Andrew Wilson. Thank you. Okay. Well, good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? Even if I step away from the microphone? Good. I sometimes wonder uh, when I'm giving these presentations. So I was asked to uh, talk about civil-military relations in China. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically about the relations not between the society as, as a whole and the military, but between the civilian sides of the government and party uh, in China uh, and the military as well. But uh, in, along the way, I'm going to talk about a lot of structural institutional issues. Um, hopefully, I won't get too much inside baseball. Or stop throwing. If I start throwing around acronyms, please tell me to stop. Um, I work for the U.S. military, and they're crazy about acronyms, and the Chinese are even more crazy about acronyms. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the Chinese military, uh, its various branches, what are the key elements of it, and what, what are basically what are the drivers of Chinese strategic behavior. Um, first branch we want to talk about is the second artillery. This is the strategic missile forces. Uh, this includes both the nuclear mission and the conventional uh, mission as well. Um, so they have the, uh, they currently practice uh, a minimum deterrence nuclear policy um, and uh, no first use as well. Although in conversations with the Chinese general a few years ago, he said in his personal opinion, China should get rid of its no first use doctrine um, because we can never win a conventional war. So if the Americans were about to strike us, we'd have to respond with nuclear weapons. If they were about to strike us conventionally, we'd have to respond with nuclear weapons. I'll get into what the meaning of that particular statement might be. Um, the fact that he said that to a group of American academics, his own personal opinion. Uh, but anyway, uh, they also uh, deal with this conventional missile, <coughs> missile mission, uh, which has particular relevance to Taiwan on the idea of a mix of medium and short range ballistic missiles as a uh, as a deterred capability. What do they look at most, mostly now? Like all areas of the Chinese military, modernization uh, is the, the mania, uh, along with informationization, it's actually the word they use, uh, transforming to an information age, uh, mobility, survivability, they're, they're both their conventional and strategic uh, forces as well, and command and control. As you can imagine, when nuclear weapons, command and control <coughs> is uh, particularly, particularly important. Um, the People's Liberation Army Air Force, People's Liberation Army Air Forces. Um, this gets a little confusing because it's not the People's Liberation Navy or the Chinese Navy, it's the People's Liberation Army Navy. Here we have the People's Liberation Army Air Forces, but it's basically a standalone Air Force. Um, 
some of their, their aircraft. They're really into drones these days, but they're also working on fourth and fifth generation fighters. Um, informationization, again, is very big. Uh, airborne uh, command and control systems. Joint integration is also a huge problem for the, and a huge focus area for the Chinese military. Uh, simply getting different services to work together. Um, exercises in China are still highly staged, so the level of jointness that they see, particularly the United States being capable of, jointness is essentially getting the different military services to actually function together in, in, in an operationally meaningful way. Um, and this is something that's been a, been a big, big challenge for the Chinese military, so one of their main focus areas. Uh, then there's the biggest chunk of the PLA, which is the PLA ground forces. This is the area where we're probably going to see uh, Xi Jinping's 300,000 uh, troop uh, reduction area come about because a lot of this is, there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of the mass of the People's Liberation Army ground forces uh, are essentially conscripts. Uh, so it would be fairly easy to downsize them, downsize that force, but also shift those resources to some of the, uh, some of the focus areas. Mechanization. Uh, basically getting enough trucks and tanks, uh, helicopters as well, working on their uh, acronyms like C4ISR, command control, uh, what, are, what are all four of them? Communications Commu computing. Communications computing, information surveillance and reconnaissance. Uh, so that's C4ISR. Don't worry, it won't be a death. Professionalization is a big issue here. Um, keep in mind that for much of its history, uh, the PLA was more focused on being red than being on expert. So becoming a professional military force is something that's very, very uh, near and dear to their hearts. Again, joint integration, working with other services, uh, being able to engage in cross-regional operations. Um, this came up in a China defense white paper a few years ago um, that we're going to focus on cross-regional uh, operations. Create a lot of uh, interest in Washington, D.C. Uh, when got sent there to ask them, what do you mean by cross-region? Are you talking about you know, between East and Southeast Asia or between East and South uh, East and South Asia, or are you talking about between <coughs> East Asia and, and South America? It's like, no, 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 we're talking about between the Jinan military region and the Shandong military region and the Guangdong military region. We're talking about cross-regional in terms of China or various military regions in China, whether or not we, we can actually operate across those. Um, what's their mission? National security, frontier defense, internal security, uh, and increasingly energy security uh, pipelines uh, in particular coming in across. Uh, Chinese uh, frontiers. Um, not an expeditionary army. It's another thing to keep in, keep in mind about the bulk of the Chinese military. It's not expeditionary. It's not designed to go other places. It's designed to defend the Chinese homeland. Um, there's other elements to the national defense apparatus as well. There's the domestic security forces, the uh, public security bureau, uh, and this includes the people's armed police. There are al were also four coast guards, four different services that we called coast guards in China. Uh, they've been nominally integrated into a single service, uh, but the extent of the integration is not, not quite clear. Um, they do a lot of domestic security. They do a lot of uh, surveillance on the home front, uh, interdiction on the home front. They protect the regime physically uh, and politically, uh, but they also are engaged in a lot of peacekeeping operations in China. In fact, China, in terms of manpower, is the largest contributor to UN peacekeeping operations, uh, for example, in Lebanon, uh, but also in Haiti, uh, interestingly enough, um, so when the uh, earthquake struck in Haiti, really interesting uh, thing happened. Uh, Haiti was, was one of the few countries that still recognizes Taiwan as the government of China, uh, and yet was home to a significant number of uh, Chinese peacekeepers, nine of whom were killed in the earthquake. Um, and it was actually the Taiwan ambassador to Haiti who coordinated the, um, the relief for the uh, Chinese peacekeepers. A well, bit of an aside, but interesting story. And this is one of the Chinese peacekeepers. Uh, they're very selective as who they really send overseas. Um, there's the cyber forces as well. It's a pretty hot topic these days. Um, the key components of that are actually in the PLA, the third and fourth department. One is about uh, computer network exploitation, and the other focuses on computer network attack. Uh, there's also something called the cyber militia. This is basically where the PLA teams with a uh, major tech university, for example. Um, and works with the faculty and students uh, to create essentially cyber militias uh, of hackers and stupers. Um, they do basically what everybody's cyber forces do, espionage, sabotage, and propaganda. Um, a lot of the targets, we're interested in our targets, uh, who they go after us, for example, I, uh, my personal data was, was re recently hacked into, uh, Office of Personal, personal Management. Uh, but there's some uh, specific targets. 
Uh, probably most important um, is the separatist movements. Uh, there's a lot of hacking, for example, of the Dalai Lama's website uh, and anything to do with t Tibet. Um, likewise with the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, if there's separatist groups operating there, uh, the Falun Gong is another organization that gets a lot of uh, uh, attention from these units. Uh, raises it as an emerging vulnerability for the PLA because if the overemphasis or the, the tremendous emphasis placed on um, cyber activity actually makes you a cyber, cyber vulnerable force as well if you make that a centerpiece. So we are willing to talk about that uh, later. Uh, I work for the Navy, so this is where we spend the, the bulk of our attention is on the modernization of the People's Liberation Army Navy um, plan, as we call it. Uh, for the last 20 years, they've been trying trying to solve the what, what I call the first island chain problem. Uh, and this dates back to the 1996 Taiwan Straits crisis, uh, when during the uh, presidential election on Taiwan, uh, the Chinese military staged a series of large-scale exercises in and around the Taiwan Strait. Uh, while this was going on, the United States sent two carrier strike groups into the waters around Taiwan. Um, the Chinese leadership found out about it on CNN. So, uh-oh, the United States can, with impunity, send carrier strike groups into our, you know, our front yard uh, and intervene in our internal affairs. And essentially, the Chinese have been trying to solve that first island chain. The first island chain refers to the chain of islands running from uh, Sakhalin <coughs> Uh, down through the Japanese home islands, through Taiwan, down the Philippines. Uh, so here it's essentially what's viewed as sort of a, a, uh, a perimeter of vulnerability, sort of the uh, a forward basing of enemy, enemy power. Yes, sir? Would you mind using the microphone? I'm having a hard time here. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. How's that? Better? Okay. Uh, so trying to modernize the PLA uh, uh, Navy as well. And uh, something that got a lot of attention in the 70th anniversary parade, which was held a few weeks ago, was the Dongfeng 21 Mahdi, Mahdi sorry, uh, nicknamed the Carrier Killer. Uh, I have friends who deal with the specifics of this particular technology, but it's basically taking a 1960s generation uh, medium-range ballistic missile uh, and making it uh, um, maneuverable uh, after reentry, so it can actually track and hit a ship that is moving. Whether or not you can actually do this is still uh, uncertain, but the idea here is that this this basically solves the first island chain problem because you have a capability that can threaten American strategic assets uh, and carrier strike groups, which are seen as the, sort of the the uh, the big stick of American uh, meddling uh, in Chinese internal affairs, sorting uh, carrier strike groups. Um, and then, so once they've solved the uh, first island chain, what do you do after that? Are we seeing the emergence of a Blue Water PLA Navy. Uh, this is their first aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, uh, which was bought from the Ukraine in 1998. I believe it was for $17 million. Uh, extensively refit. Uh, it appears to be moderately, moderately operational, uh, although actually mastering the system of systems, which is carrier aircraft operations, is very, very difficult. Um, and at the end, I'll come back and I'll talk about some of these uh, uh, maritime disputes, maritime territorial disputes uh, out there in the wider seas beyond the first island chain. Okay, now a little bit about the structure of uh, civil military relations in China. Uh, this is the 18th Party Congress in November 2012. Uh, this was the big leadership transition event. Uh, this is when Xi Jinping uh, became the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, these party congresses uh, happen every five years. So we're coming up on the, um, let's see, in 2017, we'll have the 19th party congress. These also track with the five-year plans promulgated by the Chinese uh, government as what their economic and military and, and uh, social objectives are for the next five years. So these will run from party congress to party congress. Uh, Xi Jinping, who is now the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, he's also the president of the People's Republic of China. Uh, he gets sworn in basically at the 18th Party Congress. He will be sworn out at the 20th Party Congress in 10 years, if, he, if he's still alive at that point. I have no reason to think he wouldn't be alive, uh, but basically you get a 10-year term. Uh, this is beginning the post uh, Deng Xiaoping um, uh, system of leadership transition in China. Uh, the idea that things were just way too volatile, uh, especially under, under Mao, uh, but it's still vo vulnerable, sorry, volatile under Deng Xiaoping, uh, and this is sort of bring some steady pace into it. So the idea of these 
clearly manageable five-year cycles uh, and then 10-year leadership cycles. So Xi Jinping is the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, one of his two most important posts. Uh, he is uh, seconded by um, Li, Li, why, yeah, Li Keqiang, uh, who is the premier uh, and is essentially the head of state, uh, sorry, head of the state council. So he's the number two in the Chinese Communist Party, uh, but he's the premier as well of the People's Republic of China. And here it's important to understand the distinction between the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China. They are two distinct institutions. The party is always superior to the government. Okay, the government, the, the party tracks, maps, everything, runs parallel with everything in the national and the provincial level governments, but sits aside it and slightly above it. So for example, if I am the uh, governor of say Guangdong province, I am outranked by the party secretary of Guangdong province, okay? So if I'm the governor, if I work for the state, if I work for the national government or for the provincial government under the national government, I am inferior to basically the equivalent of the party structure at that particular point. So the party runs parallel to everything in the national government. Okay, you'll notice here that um, we have the National Party Congress, uh, the Politburo, sorry, the, the Central Committee, uh, and then the Politburo. The national Party Congress is essentially all the uh, members of the party that attend the Party Congress. There's 87 million members in the Party Party Congress is representatives of those 87 uh, million members. Uh, that is headed up by the Central Committee, which is about 250 members with about probably 117, 120 alternates. Uh, that is the sort of collective leadership body of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, but that's uh, surpassed by the Politburo, which is 25 members, uh, which might meet on a weekly, bi-weekly basis, uh, but really everything of, that seriously gets done is done by the standing committee of the Politburo. And under Xi Jinping, that's seven men uh, who basically run everything in China, uh, which gives you an idea how, how incredibly busy these people are. Uh, and how many hats uh, they have to wear, in particular uh, Xi Jinping as general secretary of the party and as, um, as president of the People's Republic of China. I will point out that his, his status as general secretary of the party dwarfs his status as president of the Republic of China. He is president because he is general secretary. Okay? Uh, if he was president and he wasn't general secretary, the person who was general secretary would be the paramount leader of China. Even more, inside baseball. Whoever is the chairman of the Central Military Commission trumps everybody else. So Xi Jinping is chairman of the Central Military Commission, general secretary of the party, and president of the People's Republic of China. Okay, that makes him number one. Case in point, however, Deng Xiaoping, the last job that he gave up <coughs> for his complete retirement was chairman of the Central Military Commission. So until he gave up that particular job, he was still paramount leader of China. Um, Xi Jinping's predecessor as general secretary, Hu Jintao, who stepped down as general secretary back in uh, November 2012, he became general secretary in 2002, but his predecessor, Jiang Zemin, held on to the chairmanship of the Central Military Commission for two years into Hu Jintao's term. So Hu Jintao, at that point, while, she, uh, while Jiang Zemin still had the, held the chairmanship of the Central Military Commission, he was still the paramount leader. It was only when um, uh, Hu Jintao took over that particular job that he became paramount leader of China. Interestingly enough, Xi Jinping, when he stepped in, despite the fact that he had a, his grooming period was much shorter. Uh, he had basically only been the top leadership of the party for a little less than five years and only been the vice chairman of the Central Military Commission for two years, beginning in, in uh, 2010. Given that it was a fairly short period, his predecessors had been there five, 10, sometimes 20 years among the senior leadership. He stepped right in to be the chairman of the Central Military Commission, which was a clear indicator that he was going to be his own man and he was not going to be Hu Jintao. Um, and he, then he set about in uh, undertaking a very fast, very comprehensive consolidation of power uh, within the party. Um, 
creating new institutions, for example, the national, essentially a National Security Council, uh, creating new small groups, but putting himself in leadership positions of all of those. Uh, and his, in fact, his faction among the, um, among the standing committee of the Politburo, uh, there's seven members of the standing committee, six of them are in his faction, six of them including himself. And the only one who's not is that guy over there, Li Keqiang, who is the premier. So Li Keqiang is then also the head of the um, uh, state council, which is the uh, over, it was basically the cabinet of the national government of China. So Li Keqiang is premier, Xi Jinping is president. You see the Politburo Standing Committee. It says nine there. It's actually seven now. Politburo 25. Uh, Central Committee is 371 members. That's 250 uh, active members and uh, about 121 uh, alternates. So that's the structure of it. Here's the Central Military Commission. Uh, this is the most, as I said, the most important job that Xi Jinping has. This is chairman of this. Uh, we will know who the next General Secretary of China is going to be when that person becomes vice chairman of this Central Military Commission. Uh, that might happen in three years, probably more like five. Um, so the person who's being groomed for leadership of the Chinese Communist Party of the People's Republic of China, uh, the best indicator for that person is is they're they would be the second civilian serving on the Central Military Commission. Currently, only Xi Jinping is on the Central Military Commission as a civilian. Okay. So there are the various members of the Central Military Commission. This gentleman right here is also Minister of National Defense, the Defense Ministry. The Defense Ministry is part of the national government. Uh, his position as a member of the Central Military Commission vastly is vastly more important than his position as Minister of Defense of the People's Republic of China. Um, now, you would think the Minister of Defense would be the most senior member of the military. In fact, the most senior members of the military are the two vice chairmen of the Central Military Commission. There they are right there, an Air Force General and a PLA Army General uh, as well. That is uh, General Stan and Xu. There they are. Highlighting there that the only one not in uniform is Xi Jinping, the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. Okay, what about, uh, why was Xi Jinping able to rapidly uh, step into uh, the position he has with the, with the, with the Central Military Commission? Uh, some have said that he's the most autocratic leader China's had since Mao. Uh, that he's bucking the trend towards collective leadership, which was the, uh, was the standard operating procedure beginning with Deng Xiaoping and going through the, uh, the ten years of Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, that in fact Xi Jinping is going above and beyond to uh, cement the power of his particular faction and his particular leadership uh, at, this, at this moment. Uh, he's done that by establishing these various new offices, he's leading small groups, uh, by undertaking uh, an expansive program of anti-corruption campaigns and reform, economic reforms, anti-corruption campaigns, both in terms of the, the party and the civilian government, but also going after corruption within the PLA, which is rampant, rampant, incredibly corrupt military. Uh, how was he able to do that? Well, there's Xi Jinping up in the upper left hand. Uh, in the upper left hand. There is... Uh, um, Xi's father, revolutionary hero, was General Xi, uh, Xi Zhongxu, and he was, this is him being struggled against by Red Guards in the, uh, the, during the midst of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, he was targeted for struggle sessions, uh, he was accused of being a counter-revolutionary, uh, of plotting against the party, uh, he was cashiered from office uh, and sent down to the countryside for re-education. Uh, he came back, um, into uh, power in the late 1970s uh, when Deng Xiaoping uh, took over as paramount leader of China. Uh, in fact, it was General Xi, later Governor Xi, uh, as both governor and party secretary of Guangdong province who oversaw the beginning of the special economic zones in South China, this experiment with economic liberalization that proved to be so successful and such a turning point uh, in the rise of China as an economic powerhouse. But he was struggled against. Um, interesting, he was he is a revolutionary hero. Uh, he had joined the party at a very young age, uh, had, uh, had uh, led various uprisings in the countryside in the late 1920s, 1930s. Uh, it was he who was actually oversaw uh, a base area in Shanxi, Gansu, and Ningxia uh, region, uh, northwestern China, 
uh, which ultimately came, became the Yan'an base area. This is where Mao and what's left of the, the Red Army and the Chinese Communist Party finally ends up at the end of the Long March, uh, a desperate retreat from eastern China. They end up uh, in General Xi's, uh, basically his base camp, uh, and he provides protection uh, for the Chinese Communist Party. They survived because he had established that particular base area. He goes on to serve in the, in the later stages of the Chinese Civil War and then various positions, Vice Premier, um, Vice Minister of Defense and various other uh, prestigious positions. Um, he died back in 2002, I believe. Um, up in the upper right is Gung Biao, who is a comrade in arms. Uh, he served with um, General Xi during the Ch uh, Chinese Civil War. Uh, he, he is later Defense Minister. Uh, in his youth, Xi, Xi Jinping was a Mishu for uh, General Gung, uh, which is basically means private or personal secretary. Uh, he was basically his, his speechwriter, uh, secretary, fixer, you know, uh, eyes, ears, and hands of the, the Minister of Defense. Uh, so while Xi Jinping was not technically in the PLA, uh, he did work for the PLA for an extended period of time at a formative point in his life. Anybody know who that lovely lady on the lower right hand side is? Yes, sir. She's a wife. His wife. She's wife, yes. Major General Pung. Um, she is a famous opera and folk song singer in China. Uh, she's in the PLA. She's a uniform member of the PLA, uh, but in their culture division. <coughs> so she is a brigadier, brigadier general, major general, uh, major one star general in the in the PLA. So he has personal connections with the PLA to the PLA through his father, uh, through his his mentor Gong Biao, uh, and through his wife uh, Peng Liyan. So one of the more powerful. Uh, among the people with the most, the strongest connections with the PLA. Uh, and you see here, the interesting thing is that these are almost all, all personally, personal, personalistic ties uh, based on a unique uh, personal experience. Uh, these are not institutional. Uh, that's another thing we have to understand about the relationship between the civil side of the PLA, uh, sorry, the civil side of the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party and the military side. Uh, in the United States, we have not huge, but a big civilian defense side. Uh, we have all those policy wonks uh, who wait, you know, four or eight years to get their job in the next administration, uh, you know, work at Brookings Institution, get jobs at SMU and stuff like that. Uh, you know, not working their time before the, but the phone rings and somebody asks them to come work for the for the uh, Secretary of Defense. Secretary of Defense in our system is a civilian. Um, much of the senior leadership of the Department of Defense comes from these civilian circles. The Chinese simply do not have that. They have some civilians who teach at some of their military education institutions, the academies and the staff colleges, but for the most part, it's an institution unto itself. There are very little civilian defense expertise in China. Uh, so when you're dealing with the, with the, for example, the Minister of Defense, you're not dealing with somebody like Secretary Carter in the United States. You're dealing with a uniformed member of the PLA. Uh, nor does a person like that have the authority of Secretary Carter, as we have on, you know, in our system. Uh, nor does that person necessarily have a strong working relationship with the chief executive. Our cabinet system means the Secretary of Defense is chosen by the President of the United States. Okay, he's a member of the cabinet. He or she is a member of the cabinet, right? Uh, th these, these people are, all, are, are within the inner circle of it. And that's institutional on our side. It's got a personalistic nature, you know, because you, you know, pick people that you trust or the people you trust trust uh, to serve in those offices. But it's a very, very different system in China. And there's huge implications for uh, dealing with China as a foreign policy actor. Uh, because there's also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They have a lovely building. Really nice, it's a really cool mural inside. This is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Wang Yi. Uh, what you have to know about the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is that it's a ministry of the national government. Okay? Uh, it is under the aegis of the State Council. Okay. So, if we go way back here, okay. The Premier and head of the State Council is the Kazakh. Okay, this guy over here. Ostensibly, number two, the second most powerful person in the senior leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. But in actuality, probably not. Because he's a member of a rival, not a rival, he's a member of an alternative power faction within the senior leadership. So he's a pretty powerful guy, 
but he's not as powerful as premiers have been in the past. Okay, so number one, the guy who is the head of the state council isn't nearly as powerful or isn't even as close to as powerful as the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. In addition, the state council is the national government. Everything in the national government is a step junior to everything in the party. Okay? So the minister of defense is equal to the minister of foreign affairs within that apparatus. But the status of the minister of defense is almost meaningless. The ministry of defense is a largely ceremonial institution that deals with basically diplomatic relations with other militaries. They've got a lovely building, they've got some really nice conference rooms, but it's not the Pentagon. It doesn't function like the Pentagon. All those functions are situated within the various services of the PLA. Okay, so this is a system radically different from our own. Okay. So, the PLA is connected to the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party at the absolute highest level. The General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party is Chairman of the Central Military Commission. That is one point of contact, one point, the only point of contact between the party and the PLA at that senior level. There are party commissars within the PLA, but they've largely become an internal part of the PLA apparatus. It's not necessarily party oversight, party control of the military. So unlike our system, which pairs civilian, uh, so the civilian side of the Department of Defense with the various services, simply absent in the Chinese case. So, in addition, so basically what I'm saying is that the military, the PLA, is connected at a very, very high level to the party. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is connected much farther down the ladder. That's significant, right? Because think, think about our, 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 if you're talking to Secretary Kerry and Secretary Carter, you're talking to two people with about the same power, despite the fact that the you know, Department of Defense budget and personnel dwarfs the Department of State. In some cases, in the United States, quite often the Secretary of State is even more powerful and influential within the administration than the Secretary of Defense. Certainly if Henry Kissinger is the Secretary of State, or even if Henry Kissinger is National Security Advisor, he's going to dwarf everybody else. So, but when it comes to the PLA, the PLA is vastly much more powerful and vastly more influential than the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The PLA gets a voice in foreign policy formulation. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs simply carries out foreign policy. Now, if I knew how much of a say the PLA got in foreign policy, uh, formulation in China, I'd be getting a lot more for my talk, uh, but uh, also I, might, I might get in trouble uh, too as well. But um, that's uh, that's the sixty-four thousand dollars question. Trying to figure out how that how that works. Okay, so those are some of the institutional matters here. Do you have any questions about this? I know this. There, there were a lot of names, and I was throwing out a lot of titles and things like that. But I just want to emphasize the uniqueness of this particular system. Uh, one thing you have to remember is that the PLA is not China's army. It's not China's army. It belongs to the Chinese Communist Party. Yes, sir. Uh, so you said that the Communist Party apparatus in many ways is parallel to the state. Does that mean that um, the, the different, I would imagine, they also have cabinet departments within the state. So does the uh, Communist Party have those same exact departments? And uh, so how does this exactly work? Does the party generate an idea and then the, 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 uh, the state rubber stamps it or is it the other way around? Or how does it exactly work? Uh, more, more, more the former. Uh, it, it runs parallel and quite often the leader of the, the leading small group on X will also have a position of authority. Uh, so the optimal situation, I mentioned if you were governor of Guangdong province, uh, what, you, what you probably want is to be governor and party secretary at the same time to sort of wear those two hats. Uh, for example, in the PLA, mil military regional commanders are their own political commissars. So they are party representative, professional military representative all at once. So, but if they're separate, it's the guy in the party who's in charge of that particular portfolio in the party who's calling the shots. If the Minister of Foreign Affairs is that guy, then the Minister of Foreign Affairs is somebody you want to talk to. If the Minister of Foreign Affairs is somebody like Zhou Enlai or Chen Yi, you know, somebody with a lot of clout within the party, he's worth talking to. If he's not, he's not worth talking to. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it, run, it runs parallel, but, it, but everything in the party is always going to be a half a step above everything in the national and state government. Okay. All right. Well, what's going on? Hacking. Is this directed by the party? Is this something that the PLA is doing on its own? Uh, is it quite often what the Chinese claim? Well, if, even if it started in China, even if, if it originated in China, this is bad actors. These are civilians who are doing these things. This is not a directed government program. Uh, although I believe that we have, a, we have pretty good intel on that the PLA is actively involved in hacking, uh, in computer network exploitation and computer network attack as well. Um, what are some of the messages that are being sent out here? And how do you figure out what those messages are? Especially when, if you talk to the PLA, quite often you're going to get a very hawkish, very strident, very nationalistic, very chauvinistic take on a lot of these things. Because as the PLA professionalizes, as it sees itself as, because again, this is going to create a paradox, as a institution out there to defend the Chinese nation and tending, tending to think in more zero-sum terms, seeing itself in competition with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which has a variable sum take and is diplomatic. They become more professionalist, less politicized. The PLA maybe becomes more professional, less politicized. Sort of culturally, these institutions are going to start to move apart. In addition, you have a, another aspect of the cultural breakdown is the education system. Uh, there's almost no intermingling between civilians. People are sort of moving towards jobs on the civilian side of the government or even the non-military parts of the party apparatus uh, and the military. The military is a very sort of closed institution uh, in this sense. And they're starting to, to try to get, you know, young, bright members of the party and Member, uh, and people and bureaucrats within the, the national government to attend the Academy of Military Sciences, the National Defense University, to figure out how the system works and try to institutionalize these personalistic connections. But still, the system functions primarily on, you know, when it works well, it works in the way that Xi Jinping developed his guanxi, his ties, his networks with the PLA, which was personalistic, based on his father, his father's comrade in arms, uh, and also based on the fact that when, uh, when Xi Jinping was a teenager during the Cultural Revolution, he was sent down to the countryside. Uh, this is re-education through work, re-education through labor. Um, the Cultural Revolution sort of hits its peak in the cities in China uh, in the late 1960s. Uh, Zhou Enlai sees this chaos going on and says, well, what we've got to do is get all these crazy teenagers, these Red Guards, out of the cities. So they took them out of the cities and shipped them all down to the countryside. Uh, for re-education through labor. Um, now, the elite, even though Xi Jinping's father had been purged <coughs> from the party and himself been sent into the countryside for re-education, because he was a dyed-in-the-wool revolutionary and because Xi Jinping's father was a powerful, powerful individual, Xi Jinping got to choose where he went to the countryside. So he chose where he got sent down to, which was Shanxi province, which was where his father... <coughs> Had his was was from his father's from Shanxi province, but also where his his power base was. So this protected Xi Jinping uh, during the late stage of the Cultural Revolution, but also started his political rise because by being sent down into Shanxi province, he develops these connections with the, what's called the Shanxi Gang, uh, and actually the Shanxi Gang is very very powerful uh, right now in the senior leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it began, you know, under under Mao it was mostly people from around where Mao grew up, Hunan and Hubei provinces. Okay. Under Deng Xiaoping, it was people from Sichuan, from Deng Xiaoping's, uh, from Sichuan province and Guangxi province, from sort of his base of support where Deng Xiaoping had survived the purges of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, then it started to shift to uh, Jiangsu, and Jiangsu province and the region around Shanghai, uh, under Jiang Zemin and then Hu Jintao. And now with uh, Xi Jinping, uh, the sort of home roots of the senior leadership has started to shift up to Shanxi province, which is up there in the northwest where 
the Chinese Communists found refuge back in 1934 and where Xi Jinping builds a power base now. Okay, so without that, you don't really have a lot of formal or institutional linkages between the diplomatic corps and the military. So how do you figure out what's going on, for example, when a Chinese fishing vessel harasses a U.S. naval surveillance ship in a very dangerous way? Now, is this his doing, the fisherman? Uh, is it the provincial government, you know, that controls the home port where this guy operates out of? Is it the Coast Guard that was standing, the Chinese Coast Guard, which is, you can't see them in this particular picture, but their ships are about a mile out watching this whole thing? Or is it the PLA Navy, their ships are about two miles out watching this whole thing go on? What are the messages being sent here? It makes it very, very difficult to discern these things. And quite often, you know, what, what's going on? Is this the party telling these guys to do this? Or is this, you know, is this an experiment? Is it a fluke? Is it just as fishermen? What is, what's actually going on in this, in this situation? Um, the hottest one of these was probably the J-20 rollout in, in, in uh, January 2011. Okay, the J-20 is China's new stealth fighter. Really not that great a plane, but anyway, it's okay. Um, but it's a big deal. Um, it's rolled out, the prototype is displayed with much fanfare while Secretary Gates is visiting China. He was so insulted, he almost pulled the plug. He almost walked away from a ministerial level visit because of this. He asked Hu Jintao what was going on. Hu Jintao was like, I had no idea, I didn't know about this. So he's asking the, the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party who says, I don't know. So this incredibly bald-faced, you know, you read it as an attempt to intimidate or send a message to the United States, or is this just happened to be the day that they scheduled this and it just happened to coincide, right, with, with Secretary Gates' visit. A year later, they roll out the second one and Secretary Panetta's in China at that time. Okay, so, okay, but who's sending the message? Is it the PLA? Uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs scrambles in these situations. Um, I go to these annual meetings and, and it used to be you could see a lot of daylight between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the PLA because you meet representatives from them. Uh, and the PLA would say things like, well, you know, I, you know, like this general would say, I really don't, you know, I think we should get away from no first use, you know, because we can't win a conventional war against the United States. And, you know, you... Then the next day, you talk to somebody from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and say, well, this general said this thing. And I'm like, oh, those guys again. Uh, or, in words of another one, uh, what happened during the EP3 incident back in 2001 was that they knocked the plane down and then they closed ranks and started to lie. So the PLA starts to lie to the senior leadership and to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is stuck trying to figure this situation out operating in the blind and where the was the senior leadership in the blind too and this there's this argument there's this idea that that was increasingly the case under Hu Jintao um, let me go back a couple slides here um, this is uh, a new buzz phrase we're hearing a lot more coming out uh, in the literature about civil military relations in China it's the military commission chairman responsibility system uh, what this means, what this is an attempt to say is that uh, this is a way to think about what the role of the chairman of the Central Military Commission is. But it's also, it also puts the emphasis on the central role of the chairman of the Central Military Commission. The implication, and they say this in the literature, is that prior to Xi Jinping, it was the Military Commission vice chairman responsibility system. In other words, that Hu Jintao, who at that time was chairman of the military commission, was handing over responsibility for military affairs to the vice chairman, who were both uniformed military at that time. Xi Jinping is reversing course on that. The military is not out there creating problems for us. The military is now back being an absolutely subordinate, absolutely loyal, well-behaved servant of the party. So, so is this an indication of what was going on beforehand was either inadvertent or was the PLA acting on its own. But what does that mean for 
stuff that's going on more recently. So Xi Jinping's, you know, consolidating his power, engaging in these purges, launching these anti-corruption campaigns, but he's also doing things the PLA likes, right? We're going to reduce the size of the force by 300,000, but we're going to keep increasing, you know, double-digit increases in the military budget year on end. So we're going to give you what you want, professionalization, informationization. We're going to give you better barracks, better pay, all those things that you're asking for. But the cost of that is subordination. Stop doing, number one, stop messing around in policy issues. If we want you to do something related to policy, we'll have you do that. The other thing is fix the corruption problem. Because, yeah, we've been throwing money at you for a generation. And, yeah, we understand a little bit of corruption helps. But this naked corruption is bad. You know, when, when bloggers in China are snapping pictures of $100,000, $200,000 cars with military license plates on them, or people in uniform getting out of those cars wearing $40,000, $50,000, $100,000 watches, taking pictures of these things and posting them on the internet. Stop getting caught. Stop getting photographed being corrupt. Okay. To tell you how bad corruption is in China, you know, let me give you an example of bad corruption in China. You, you know who Bo Xi Lai is? Okay, Bo Xi Lai was the, uh, it was the party chief uh, of Chongqing, yes, Chongqing City. Real up-and-comer in the party, looked like he was going to be on um, the uh, uh, fast track uh, to be in the, uh, the Central Committee and then possibly into the Politburo. So this was a mover and shaker, uh, fast tracker. He lost his various positions in the party and the government because his wife got caught killing their money launderer. <laughs> because the chief of police who helped her do it tried to defect the United States and spilled the beans. That's how bad it has to get for you to lose your position. <laughs> Not that you have a personal money launderer, but that you have them killed and you get caught doing it. <laughs> so what's going on now? Bering Sea deployment. Five Chinese naval vessels operating, actually at one point, within 12 nautical miles of the Aleutian Islands, the American side of the Aleutian Islands. Same time that President Obama's in Alaska. So are they trying to upstate the president? They're trying to send a message? Or are they actually trying to help the president sell this icebreaker idea? What better? You know, he's up there trying to say, well, the Arctic matters. We need two or three more icebreakers. Chinese show up. That helps his argument, doesn't it? It's, it seems kind of ironic, but you send him up there. OK. Um, what about in the, in the realm of maritime law enforcement? This is just an idea of how much hardware the Chinese put into maritime law enforcement issues. These are the various Coast Guards, uh, along with the PLA Navy, that, that deals with coastal issues. That's a huge amount of hardware. And then there's these various disputed spots. Uh, this is just the South China Sea. The East China Sea has a whole bunch of these as well. Uh, but these are between the uh, Spratly Islands, Islands and the parallel Paracel Islands. Uh, you know about the, the, the dashed line? This dashed line that appeared on a, on a map in, in the Republic of China in 1947, uh, recently, about the last 10 years, has sort of come back uh, into, uh, into vogue. And then recently, there's a possibility that uh, senior members of the party and the PLA have referred to the South China Sea as a core national interest, on par with Taiwan, on par with Tibet. So the idea that this is a sovereignty issue on par with those other areas where there's no wiggle room at all is, is quite interesting. There's still some ambiguity there. But what has been going on, uh, this has been going on. Terraforming. OK, what these were were reefs. These are not islands. They don't count as islands. They're not above water at high tide, or the, are they habitable? But beginning 30, 40 years ago, Pour some concrete, build a building. Okay, where the original building is, start to, and th that's the way it stayed. Right, that's the original building up there. You have the left hand, those two little. So you see that right there, that yellow square and that yellow square right there. That's the original building. Quite literally, the block of concrete that sits on top of the reef is that big. Okay, tiny little outpost. Well, now we're going to start filling in. So we get all these dredgers out there. There are the dredgers, you see them? Mm -hmm. 
you know, in the, inside that atoll, like 30 or 40 dredgers digging up sand, dumping it on these roofs. Terraforming, right? Show you the big one. This, this is Fiery Cross Reef. This is the one disputed with Vietnam. This is the original structure over there, the little concrete pad on top of the, the atoll. And that's 10 acres, sorry, 10 hectares worth of sand, uh, including a 3,000 meter long runway, which some would argue, people I respect, uh, this is about military power projection. Because the Chinese have this aircraft carrier, it's down actually uh, in their main South Seas Fleet naval base at, at Hainan Island. What you discover when you get an aircraft carrier is that an aircraft carrier is vulnerable if it doesn't have ground-based air support to protect it. Uh, and this is a way to get ground-based air support farther away from the Chinese coast because combat aircraft can take off, off that runway. All of them. So there he is from up above. But it's really f hard to figure out who's sending you these messages and what the messages mean. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Great, why don't you uh, uh, have a seat, have a, have a drink. Oh, yes, can we get some more? Uh, and we'll, we'll open it up to questions. I will, uh, I'll take the, the prerogative. Um, this is a pessimistic story that you're telling. Right? This, is, this is not a feel-good moment, if you, if you think about it. The sum total of all of this. The professionalization of the PLA has, has given it sort of a national feel, which is bad because it might be absorbed with nationalism. That's a dangerous animal. Meanwhile, the party is still in control, uh, but we don't really know who's calling the shots at any given moment, and the poor diplomats and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are always in the dark. So in, in a case in which Chinese political ambitions seem to be expanding in the region, uh, the United States is concerned about that, but there are no clear lines of communication. And there's, there's a real possibility for misconceptions and faulty signals and signals that aren't received well. Is there a good news story here? Can, can I find a silver lining in this? And I just want to test it out. It might be totally nuts. But let me test out a, an optimistic story that maybe professionalization of the PLA ends up being a good thing. Okay? Be for a couple of reasons. One, because the process of professionalizing means mimicking the United States, which means talking more to the United States, in, at least in terms of military to military communications. Right? And maybe the PLA sort of imbibes the notion of subservience and civilian control and, and all the things that we take for granted. Maybe it's also a good thing that the PLA starts to think of itself as a national army and not a party army. Right? Because at one point in your talk, I think you mentioned that you know, there are times that what the party wants is maybe not good for what is good for the whole nation of China. Maybe PLA leaders start to get that too. And maybe if they start to think of themselves as a national army, not a party army, they will start to push back, at least gently, uh, against their party bosses and say, maybe we should rethink these, these moves. Maybe we should slow down. Is, is there any chance of good news coming out of this process of politicization, or is it just going to make things more confused and, and more dangerous? Yes. Yeah, it was. Oh, wait, come on. Um, well, you, you highlighted one of the, the good news stories, is that Professionalization can uh, can engender humility uh, in the sense that the more you study professional militaries, the more you study, for example, the joint capabilities, joint integration, say the U.S. military, uh, the more you realize how far behind the curve you actually are, uh, which might make you lack less hawkish, less eager to get into a fight um, with, uh, with basically anybody. It's not just the United States; it's you know, Japan is a very very capable as well, and so uh, the, the more you're familiar, the more professional you become, the less interested you are in that. Um, there, there are people who do write about a, a possible coup, a military coup in China, based on exactly the sort of second trend you were talking about, which is that the, the military becomes much more, begins to think of it as, as a savior of the nation, and it's certainly advertised as a savior of the nation. So we advertised you know, a couple weeks ago in this parade as the, as the great savior of the nation. Um, and that the party 
either because it's taking China in the wrong direction or it's doing things to the, the military that the military doesn't like, uh, taking away funding, uh, being too aggressive in the anti-corruption campaign, uh, being too uh, selective in the anti-corruption campaign. It's clear that Xi Jinping is launching the anti-corruption campaign not necessarily to clean up the PLA, but to use that as an excuse to get rid of rival factions within it might spur the PLA you know, to take some sort of action to uh, knock the party back or over, as the case may be. So that's, a, that's sort of the, the dangerous thing. Um, one good news story here is that potentially good news story, and it's going to sound paradoxical, is that um, the hammer has come down from Xi Jinping. Uh, purges are taking place. Uh, messaging has gotten much more unified uh, in China. I said a few years ago, I go to this annual national security forum uh, in, in Beijing, uh, and up until two or three years ago, you quite often see this daylight between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the PLA. Um, you know, with PLA, it was like, ah, the those diplomats, uh, and then the diplomats would be like, you can't imagine all the trouble the PLA causes us all over the place. Um, and disagreements about you know, policy issues as it relates to North Korea, for example. You know, the PLA general says, well, ah, I'm not really that concerned about North Korea you know, getting nuclear weapons. And the Ministry of Foreign Affairs guy says, that's crazy. I mean, North Korea with nuclear weapons, that's, that's, that's a nightmare. Um, so, the, you know, sort of, Daylight culturally, but also daylight in terms of policy, you don't see that anymore. There's an absolute, you know, maniacal obsession with, with the one belt, one road concept right now. Um, and this is the operationalization of Xi Jinping's China dream. Uh, strong, resurgent China, uh, but China is also uh, not quite a superpower yet, but clearly the great power in Asia, uh, and sort of the hub of all good things that are happening in Asia. Um, and One Belt, One, One Road refers to uh, basically the Maritime Silk Road and the Inland Silk Road. Um, and you can couch what's going on in the South China Sea in those terms. Well, the Chinese certainly do that. This is not a military takeover of the South China Sea. This is, we're, we're putting in aids to navigation. We're putting in lighthouses, we're putting in buoys, we're putting in reef markers, we're putting in uh, air bases for search and rescue operations. Uh, this is a public good that we're doing down there. This is not about military power projection. Um, likewise, our projects in Central Asia, these high-speed rail projects, these uh, pipelines and things like that, that's a, that's a public good, that's, that's a collective good for the people of, of Central Asia and for the, the globe, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect these benighted areas of Afghanistan to Germany with high-speed rail. And imagine, you know, the, the, the sapphire and, and, um, and lapis lazuli trade, you know, that's gonna revolutionize Afghanistan. Afghanistan's finally gonna be the paradise. So it's promised it's gonna be. Um, and you know th this has become you know, the PLA is talking about this because their partnerships with regional militaries are, are front and center on that. Their arms sales uh, in that part of the world, uh, and it's front and center with the, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because this is this is our new this is our new agenda uh, in foreign affairs. So the good news of that is that it's forcing the PLA and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to communicate about these particular issues. Maybe there'll be some follow-on benefit from that. At the same time, it seems to me that um, the obsession with One Belt, One Road, especially this take to the South China Sea, it looks like Beijing has given up on trying to deal um, bilaterally on these issues, especially with democracies. Uh, and it's just said the hell with it. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna stake the claim as we see it. And diplomat, diplomatic consequences begin. Uh, who cares about Vietnam? Um, if we can build pipelines across Myanmar and have naval bases, potentially they have naval bases in Pakistan. We don't need to worry about Thailand or Philippines. It's pesky democracy. You know, we're much more comfortable dealing with, you know, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan. Those are such regimes we can't Open it up for questions, please.
You mentioned earlier that China maintains one of the large, well, China is one of the largest contributors to United Nations peacekeeping forces. What is the PLA's rationale behind doing so? Is it international legitimacy or something else? It is definitely international legitimacy. Um, it is always, always done through the United Nations, which ended up, which created that unique circumstance in Haiti, uh, where you have a UN mission, but in a place where the, the government does not recognize the people of China. I took that as a great sign of maturity. Uh, on the part of the PRC, that they went forward with that, uh, and that in the midst of that tragedy, where the uh, and, and, and it's not the PLA that's doing this; it's the People's Armed Police, the Public Security Bureau. They were hived off from the PLA. There's still a connection there, but the idea is that these are not these are not military forces. They do, do not serve a combat role. Their support, their peacekeeping, their logistics, um, their security. Um, but also, it's, it's good, it's, case in point, after the Lebanon War, uh, they quadrupled the size of their mission in Lebanon. And that was in part because, you know, Lebanon needed more peacekeepers, needed more, you know, humanitarian assistance at that point. But it was clear that the PLA was going to school on what precision strike munitions, precision guided munitions do, um, and how it is that you recover from precision munition strikes, and also how do you maintain command and control during basically a high technology war? You know, how does some, you know, uh, Hamas, no, that's right. Hezbollah, Hezbollah, sorry, Hezbollah. Uh, how does Hezbollah maintain command and control while being, you know, peppered with JDAMs? Um, so the Chinese were very, very interested in that because Israel, Israeli Defense Forces are using you know, technology on par with what the United States would use uh, in a similar scenario. So. Uh, yes, sir. thank you very much for this presentation. I was wondering if you could tell us a little more about um, the future of China-Taiwan uh, relations and the implications of these dynamic civil military dynamics on the Taiwan issue. By the, by the way, did everybody hear the question in the back? I forgot to mention, we do have microphones set up. So did everybody get that? There you go. Maybe you can just ask it as well. Thank you. All right, so once again, um, I was wondering if you could tell us more about the future of U uh, US, no, sorry, China-Taiwan relations, especially the impact of those uh, civil military dynamics on the way China is going to handle the Taiwan issue. Thank you. Great. Um, well, I think the Taiwan issue is the expression, is the exception that proves this larger dysfunctional dynamic. When it comes to Taiwan, um, nothing occurs outside the control of the party and outside the control of the General Secretary. Because uh, the General Secretary is the head of the Taiwan leading small group. So everything related to Taiwan is managed at a very, very high level. Um, because of the structure of this leading small group. Um, the, the impetus for creating a security council equivalent was try to get an equivalent amount of central, central party control over all the other things that the PLA could be doing, among other things, that the PLA could be doing that could be causing, that could be read as strategic or political. Um, because, you know, part of it is, well, the anti-satellite shoot down in 2007, in January 2007. Um, there was the claim that, you know, senior leadership hadn't been briefed on it, or if they'd been briefed on it, they'd been briefed in very general terms, and no one had put, you know, no one had sort of gauged the political strategic significance of this. And by the way, the Chinese had telegraphed it, you know, for weeks in advance that they were gonna do this. Um, so what we would read, you know, give you an obvious example. Right now, there's a big debate going on about whether or not we should be engaged in tit-for-tat stuff in the South China Sea, whether the United States Navy should make a point of steaming within 12 nautical miles of one of these artificial islands, um, you know, just to make a statement to the Chinese. But this is a conversation that goes on between the Navy, the Chairman, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the President, and the National Security Advisor. That's constantly going on. Um, a lot of times what's going on in China is because the senior leadership of the party is so small in numbers and the tasks they have on their plate, 
were so numerous that a lot of stuff that the PLA does that has implications like this quite often, you know, they, they, they only realize it after the fact. But that doesn't largely happen with relations to Taiwan because you know, any operations or exercises near in the Taiwan Straits are always very carefully coordinated. The timing is always um, uh, is always uh, very carefully handled. Um, I believe that the mainland Beijing feels much more comfortable about the Taiwan situation now um, because in their eyes they have largely solved the problem, the operational problem that confronted them in 1996, which was the United States could intervene with impunity. Um, now we have some capability, not necessarily to prevent them from doing that, but from presenting a credible threat that we could inflict some harm if they chose to do that, which we don't want to have to do, and you don't want us to have to do it. Uh, so I think they feel quite comfortable that they've solved this sort of military problem that they confronted in the Taiwan Straits, and that makes them much more politically secure. Um, and trend lines are, are you know, it's, it's clear that independence is not gaining momentum in Taiwan. Uh, and that you know, interconnection with the mainland uh, has been beneficial to both sides, and it's not really in our best interest to, to, to you know, kill that particular goose because the golden eggs are so, so plentiful. Um, but there's always the national crisis uh, scenario, which is something absolutely terrible happens. Uh, the economy in China really starts to implode, uh, and powers that be in Beijing want to distract the attention uh, of the population away from that, but also want to demonstrate the absolute you know, uh, critical role that the party plays and, and the absolute necessity of one party, one party dictatorship in China, which is defensive territorial integrity. Uh, and the, the clearest place you can do that and make, a, make the biggest splash with the, with the most sort of, you know, popular passion payback is when it comes to Taiwan. So, do these capabilities then make, you know, they solve the problem, but does that make them a little more dangerous? Now, well, they might, might they be willing to, to play a little, you know, exploit that situation a little bit more so? Again, I, I don't know, but, it's, I, but with regards to Taiwan, that, that's something that's very tight recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Historically, the Russians and the Chinese have had a long history of suspicion. Um, and since, of course, the fall of the Soviet Union, the Russians, they lost uh, control of Central Asia and the Caucasus. So have the Chinese made any uh, strong efforts to gain control of Central Asia and, you know, oil-rich countries like Azerbaijan? And if so, how have the Russians responded and have they, has it caused friction or have the Russians been generally complacent because now it seems like that in this partnership, at least, uh, the Chinese are the senior partners and the Russians are uh, just, you know, just being carried along. Yeah. Uh, there, I mean, you hear a lot of rhetoric in, in, in Russia about, you know, the Chinese taking over this and the Chinese taking over that. Um, you know, through the popular nationalistic press, you know, the, uh, you know this, this idea of this incredible osmotic pressure in China uh, in these vast, unpopulated wastelands in, in, you know, in Asia Russia. Uh, that you know the Chinese are sort of swarming in there. Um, you know, Chinese investment is, is certainly you know up. Um, but relations with Russia are you know Putin was there for the parade, right? And, you know, that, that's that's his kind of thing too. I mean, you know, military parades and like a, of the old sort of Soviet style. If, have you seen the parade? If you haven't, you got to watch the video. It's just absolutely incredible. Uh, but you know, for those of us who remember the Cold War, remember these sort of red square type of stuff. It was that. It was that meets the, the Beijing Olympics opening ceremonies. It's, it's, it's amazing. Scary. Scary, scary, scary. Uh, oh, um, before I get to that, um, we were mentioning earlier about security, the sense of security that uh, for that parade, which is celebrating the 70th anniversary of a great national achievement, um, and you know, you know, celebrating national greatness, um, that all but 19,000 people in Beijing basically under house arrest. 19,000 people had tickets to attend the parade. Everybody else was told to stay inside, close the blinds, and watch it on TV. 
to a crowd zone. That's how secure this regime is. Okay, uh, relations with Russia have tended to be very good. Um, there's that constant sort of geostrategic, geohistorical tension between the two. And certainly some in China see, you know, impute to, China, to, to Russian arms sales behavior, uh, you know, an agenda, which is Russia is happy to sell the Chinese warships and missiles and submarines because that encourages China to look at the United States as an enemy, to look to its maritime frontiers, not to its land frontiers. So this is sort of strategic arms sales. Uh, there's that sense of competition between the two, that you're happy to buy things from the Russians but never trust them. Uh, there's a sense of competition, you know, this one belt, one road is like, well, how does Vladimir Putin feel about this? That you're going to, you know, you're basically going to pave Central Asia um, and, you know, put a, you know, Chinese noodle shops at, at, all, at all the rest stops along these super highways and sort of, sort of take over the zone, which is clearly what they would not have to So there's those tensions, there's, but these stuff, that stuff hasn't manifested to the level yet where you start to see, you know, I think Putin's watching very carefully, but I don't think it's, it's reached that level of sort of great power competition yet. Uh, in those regions. And I think the, the mutual benefit is still pretty good. It's the the, the cross-border trade is, is sort of in the pits right now, but um, there's, there's no yet sort of doing, you know, break the treaty. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Steve, please. Uh, we recently, uh, the, last year, had a very knowledgeable individual um, tell us, tell the Tower Center, for those of the Tower Center, that there was great, he had great concern about um, China's buildup of a potential buildup of Blue Water Navy, the intent of China to move out into the world's oceans, and the United States, um, the United States position of a lack of investment in the assets that we would need to continue to dominate the seas. I was curious as to what you know your um, assessment is of our posture and related to that, perhaps China's intentions based on what your understanding of things are. Great. Uh, terrific question. Um, the Ch Chinese naval development for the past 20 years has overwhelmingly been focused on solving the Taiwan, that very specific Taiwan problem. Uh, developing the right mix of you know, submarine surface vessels, in particular missiles, either fired from ships or fired, fired from these, these uh, road mobile carriages to create this contested zone. Okay. And we, you know, we sort of have to write into what we see, the Chinese building and buying and deploying some sort of strategic coherence, but for all intents and purposes, that's what they're doing. They don't write, you know, at least in stuff that I read open source about this, but it, it doesn't make sense for them not to be doing it. So they say they essentially solve that problem um, sufficiently. What do you do with all the stuff that you've now bought? Uh, can you do, have it do other missions? Um, you know, so they got this aircraft carrier. It spent years up north. And when we looked at it, it as up north, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's in Dalian. Dalian's, you know, so the Northeast Fleet, that's where they have, that's where the two ballistic missile submarines are. So the fact that they're in the same place, I think, well, that means they're kind of leaning towards the way the Soviets thought about aircraft carriers, these sort of bastions. And they're going to put it out in the Yellow Sea, in the Bohai Gulf, and they're going to have a couple of ballistic missile submarines, and the aircraft carrier, and the strike group. It would be like what the Soviets used to do. Um, but then they moved it, and they moved the carrier. Oh, and then they also named it the Yali, which is a provincial name for, for Northeast. But then they moved it down to Hainan, right on the South China Sea. So, okay, what's the aircraft carrier going to be about now? Um, I don't think they know. I mean, they just recently got it sort of operational. Uh, it's not clear that it's a, it's a real, it's really an aircraft carrier. And if it, even if it's fully operational, it would be, have about a quarter of the strike power of a Nimitz class carrier. Um, likewise, the, the Navy, in terms of numbers, in terms of ships, is huge. But in terms of blue water ships, it's very, very modest. Um, the Chinese have engaged, I think if they're up to 12, maybe even 14 uh, of these um, counter-piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden. 
which has been a huge public relations win for the Chinese, uh, but also a very, very steep learning curve about operating that far away uh, from home. Um, what, we, you know, what they've also discovered is that, they, you know, and they know this because their national policy is against it, they have no overseas bases, not. Uh, and the current national policy is we don't establish overseas bases. That's what the hegemonic imperialist powers do. Uh, we can sign you know, agreements with various commercial ports, and we can rely on commercial infrastructure to support our military operations that far afield. But whether or not you could rely on you know, civilian commercial infrastructure more time. So, in terms of power checks and capability, in terms of ship, the, the ships they have, the skill sets they have, and then just the logistical challenges of operating in the global, on the, on the, on the high seas across the globe, they're, they're decades away from doing that. So, yeah, uh, they're making they, they're making a lot of investments in their navy, um, but right now their entire national defense budget is about the same size as the U.S. Navy's budget. I'm not saying ignore it, uh, but you know they. And at the same time, 90% of the mental and strategic energy in China goes towards regime survival and national defense, and national defense in a much narrower sense. Uh, this is about defending this space we claim as China, and uh, by the way, keeping the people, a lot of people who don't want to be part of China part of China uh, in that. So that's so much the energy uh, of the regime, the, the Chinese Communist Party leadership, uh, that very little, there's very little extra left over to, for sort of master plans for ruling the world uh, and for sailing the, the, the global commons like up at their hand would have us do. Uh, last question, Ricky. Um, my question is regarding the South China Sea. Um, and uh, where is Xi Jinping um, in the um, what um, China is doing in the South China Sea? What I mean is, on the one hand, you can see that Xi Jinping is at the same side as PLA, um, but on the other hand, you can see it as uh, so now Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign is targeting uh, People's Liberation Army, and then also Xi Jinping tries to um, improve the diplomatic relationship with various countries. So PLA may find kind of disturbing Xi Jinping's attempt in the foreign policy uh, making by uh, being aggressive in the South China Sea. So uh, which one is more uh, plausible um, interpretation? Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's Xi Jinping's challenge, right? I mean, he's got to keep the PLA in line. He's got to cultivate the PLA, but he's also, you know, he's got he's to win their hearts and minds, as it were, in some ways, but he's also got to keep them in line, keep them subordinate, get them to clean up their act. Uh, but he's got to, you know, he's also got to manage relations with the United States. Uh, what's interesting about these, what's going on in the South China Sea is that when you suddenly start to engage in massive, you know, dredging operations, these big, you know, and it shows up on all of them, everybody's on Google Earth looking at all these things and, you know, uh, everybody gets really, really excited about it because you have this capability. They have all the ships. They have all that infrastructure experience and constantly dredging harbors and you know, that, you know, send it all down there. We have this excess capacity. We'll do that. What are we doing? Are we doing it just to stop? I mean, you know, does Iran or does North Korea buy a bunch of centrifuges and start spinning them around uh, for bargaining leverage? You know, Maybe we get the Americans to pay us to stop doing this, right? Genius. Uh, you know, so th there, there is value in stopping it. So you can so say, well, okay, we did, we did this, we satisfied, we, we took several steps forward in you know, advocating our, our unique uh, perspective on uh, laws of the sea, about you know, national, national territory, sovereignty, and, and those issues. But we, we can also stop it. And our stopping is, is interesting. You move the, the goalposts of good behavior. So you engage in really, really bad behavior for six months. And then by stopping it, you can then, you know, and, and then go into the, go into the, uh, 
uh, state visit with President Obama saying, oh, well, you know, we, we stopped doing that. You know, well, now let's talk. So, yeah, Xi Jinping is, you know, he's on a, I don't envy the, the senior leadership of the Chinese Communist Party because there are a very small number of people doing an awful lot of uh, things and, and wearing many hats and juggling many constituencies at the same time. Uh, PLA, huge among them, but Xi Jinping wants to have the PLA be an asset to him not a headache for the PLA just because of its bulk uh, and its endemic corruption and, you know, it's, the, the extent to which it infiltrates Chinese society is, is a huge headache and it's a big management challenge for them. Well, you haven't given me a headache. We've learned a lot. We've filled our heads with a lot of knowledge and uh, it just falls to me to say thank you and thank you all for coming tonight.